Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joachim Benzler from Friedrich Schiller University of Jena, and I'm moderating today's session. Uh, I'm really excited and uh, looking forward to the presentation of Julia Martini, whom I'm going to uh, introduce now. Uh, Julia is a data scientist who currently works at the United Nations World Food Program in the Hunger Monitoring uh, Unit. Uh, Julia studied uh, I studied, uh, let's, let's go, I uh, missed here. Yeah, civil engineering uh, at the University of uh, Firenze in Italy, and then continued a master in structural engineering at the Delft University. After that, she has been visiting researchers at Stellenbosch University in South Africa, and has been researcher uh, at Delft University, and is now data scientist, and machine learning expert at uh, the World Food Program. And Julia, I met you at uh, AI for Good Summit in Geneva, and I was really excited about what you are doing there at the uh, World Food Program with machine learning. And I'm really looking forward to your presentation. And please help me to welcome Julia here. Julia, it's, it's your floor. Thank you. So hi everyone, thanks for having me today. So um, I will start talking for who's not very familiar with WFP about WFP, which is the world's largest humanitarian organization working towards zero hunger by 2030. WFP delivers food, cash and other assistance in emergency. At the same time, we focus on sustainable development, promoting long-term change by working in partnership with national governments and communities. WFP is funded entirely by donations from governments, companies and private individuals. So WFP is operational in 123 countries and territories, and then it has uh, about 2,022 employees worldwide. Last year, uh, reached 160 million people with assistance and received about 14 billion in contribution. So these numbers, I think, are quite important when we realize and we think that we are facing the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II. This crisis is driven by COVID-19, the economical crisis due to the war in Ukraine, the climate crisis, and other worldwide conflict. It's estimated that as of June 2023, 345 million of people are facing acute food insecurity in 79 countries where WFP provides direct assistance and data is available. I think that this number 
it's quite striking when we compare it with the number of 2017, when it was estimated that 124 million of people were facing acute food insecurity in 51 countries. We can see from this slide that back then in 2017, 91 million of beneficiaries were reached, while last year this number went up to 160 million. So it means that increased almost doubled, but still the number of people that are in need increased more. The funding of WFP is 100, that WFP receives is 100% voluntarily and is largely by government. For 2023, it was expected that the regional operational requirement is 21.5 billion dollars. Um, actually, the forecasted funding was only 10 billion, and actually we had a funding gap of about 15.1 billion in July. So, as you might have read, this uh, this funding gap is leading to important aid cuts in multiple countries such as Haiti, DRC, Somalia, and Afghanistan. It's estimated that with a study that was published recently that uh, for WFP, every 1% cut in food assistance pushes about 400,000 people into emergency hunger. So I think it's normal to ask ourselves, how can we reach zero hunger by 2030 uh, when we have less resources available? In this scenario, early warning systems and anticipatory action become crucial. Uh, to, set that, to set up this, uh, of course, there are a number of questions that needs to be answered and information needs to be available. We need to answer the question of who is the most vulnerable, how many are the most vulnerable, where are they, what is the, situa how, what is the situation, how it is evolving in time, how can WFP be effective, which, which solution is the most effective, and what is happening to the ones that we cannot reach. Of course, WFP uh, collects data with also other partners, with other UN agencies, and uh, food security assessment are standards. However, face-to-face -face assessments have some criticalities. The first, uh, the first criticality is that when we go to the field, we collect data, we go back to the office, we analyze the data, and then we publish them, the data might be already outdated. Moreover, Face-to-face -face assessment are, of course, hard to perform in areas where there are conflict. And more than 70% of people that are acutely food insecure live in, in areas of conflict. So there is a problem of access. Additionally, face-to-face uh, -face assessments are um, conducted biannually. So we might miss some information about seasonal deterioration, localized development, or short-term disaster impact. And as a last criticality, also traditional face-to-face -face assessment rarely also collect cross-sectoral data. So we might add inf and we might need additional information. About 10 years ago, uh, WFP also started to uh, collect data remotely. And this uh, is done to facilitate, to address all the criticalities that I mentioned before, and to therefore to facilitate a timely diagnosis of the situation and to increase awareness among stakeholders. This also allows a rapid trigger for the analysis of a service if it's necessary. This also allows for better decision making and of course can be used for more effective advocacy. How is this remote collection performed? This is done through computer assisted telephone interviews and it's done in a representative uh, way for at some national and national level. The indicators, the food security indicators that we collect are the same that are also used for an integrated food security phase classification. So this also allows for comparison and the data is analyzed automatically and the results are made available in real time. Therefore, WSP kind of built a real-time monitoring suite, which is an integrated global hunting, hunger monitoring system that collects, analyzes, and displays real-time information on key food security metrics but also conflict, weather events, and other drivers of food insecurity across nearly 90 countries. All this information is collected and displayed in one place, which is the Hunger Map Live, which is our main product, the main product of my team and my unit. Uh, is a publicly available website, and of course, I invite everybody to, to go and have a look. We also have other products, which are the insights. We have global, regional, and country insights.
how are the data that we collect and displayed used? They are used for multiple in multiple ways. One for program monitoring, so and program operations, so to trigger more in-depth assessment and scale of WFP assistance in response in response to external shocks, for example, droughts, inflation, and conflict. Is used for inform early warning analysis and corporate decision, as for example in WSP operational task force in response to the global food crisis. But also these are shared with external partners, and are, for example, are used the real time data that we collect are also used in IPC and the Cadre Modelize. So at the moment, if you go on the hunger map, you can see data related to food security of two groups. One is the real-time food security monitoring system, which I took the, so far. So we have at the moment in place in 33 countries. And these uh, are also complemented by uh, data from machine learning models for 56 countries. For uh, now, So where we now cast or estimate the food security situation in areas where the data is limited, or we don't collect the data, because of course the data collection is pretty expensive. So at the moment we have on the hunger map live 89 countries where this information is available. So the real time monitoring data is the starting point for multiple um, for multiple analysis and applications. One is the data triangulation and the setup of alerting system. So based on a set of threshold, we define food security alerts, but also alerts related to food security drivers. And also the data is used to feed the machine learning application where we have two main applications. One is now casting model, where we make daily estimates of food security indicators where the real time data is not available. But also uh, we are setting up forecast forecasting model where we make up to 90 days food security estimates in countries where actually the, the data is collected. And I will go through these three applications one by one. So for con what concerns the alerting system, we define uh, possible food crisis as the combination of multiple alerts. Of course, a uh, food security alert, which is defined as the deterioration of some food security indicators compared to the three previous three months or, or six months. And additionally, we define also climate, hazard, economic, and conflict alert. So if we have for multiple days a food security alert, plus one of the climate hazard, economic or conflict alert, we define a possible food crisis. So we have some sort of alerting system, as you might see from this animation. For what concerns the machine learning application, as I mentioned, we have the now casting and the forecasting. So the now casting is to estimate the current level of insufficient food consumption. And this, we use it in countries where we do not collect data. We use a machine learning algorithm, which is widely used in the machine learning community, which is the gradient boosting and is deployed at the moment in 56 countries. This is a unique model that makes estimates for all these 56 countries. Uh, and then we have forecasting, where we actually estimate the future level of insufficient food consumption, looking at 36 and 90 days ahead. And this is used in countries where we do collect the data uh, in real time. We have two different approaches at the moment uh, uh, that we have developed. One is based on reservoir computing and one is also based on XGBoost. At the moment, this is piloted in five countries. It's still not displayed on the hunger map, but we are, we are, still, we are still working on it and we are uh, continuously iterating with the country offices uh, to make improvements to the, to the virus model. In this case, uh, the forecasting models is one per each country. So, and for, for both of these uh, applications, we have peer-reviewed paper. If someone is interested, these are available uh, for in additional information. So looking at the now casting model with a bit closer eye, we make estimates at first level administrative area, again, where real-time food security data is not available. And we make estimates of the number of people with insufficient food consumption, and also the number of people with crisis level or above coping strategy. So we uh, fit a model using data spanning 78 countries across 17 years. So since 2006 up to date. So we have built a series of input variables uh, using data coming from the key uh, drivers of food insecurity. And then these are updated every night and then these are fed into the model. 
which makes estimates with also an uncertainty interval. For the uncertainty interval with a bootstrap approach. So in detail, the, the data set that we use are for the input variables are related to the key three key drivers of food insecurity, which are economic shocks, extreme weather events, and conflict. So in detail for conflict, we use the number of conflict related fatalities. And then for what concern economic shocks, we look at market prices, but also at food at the line inflation and also currency exchange. For what concerns um, the weather events, we look mainly at and vegetation index and rainfall data. In particular, the input variables that we are currently using are the historical rainfall and NDVI value, but we also look at the one and three months anomaly for what concerns the rainfall and the three months anomaly for what concerns the NDVI. Of course, our approach is still in, in development, so we always try to improve our methodology. And at the moment, we are testing some input variables related to uh, economic um, weather events. So we are looking also to include the seasonal cal seasonality calendar, land use mask, and also um, to separate the rainfall and NDVI values for crop and pastures. One of the um, main challenges that we encountered, or one of the kind of important points that we discovered is when we communicate our data and our estimates uh, to stakeholders, especially when they are not technical, is the ability to explain why uh, there is uh, a variation in our estimates from one day to another. So, of course, all the input variables change in time, but which change is driving the change in the prediction? Which one is driving it the most? Is this reliable? Does it make sense? Is this expected? So this is some information that country offices, regional bureaus, other stakeholders usually ask us. So to face uh, this uh, challenge, uh, we use a method that is based on the sharp values to better understand the drivers of the prediction. So in order not to have these machine learning models just as a black box. So how does this work? So um, we first find the model base baseline of the prediction. So the baseline prediction is the expected predicted, predicted value of the model, which is actually uh, calculated by inputting into the model all null values uh, for, uh, for the input variables. Uh, in this case, the, the model uh, by default uses the average of the every input variable from the training set. And then positive sharp values denote the feature, uh, features which push the prediction higher than the model baseline, while negative sharp values denote uh, features which push the prediction lower than the model baseline. So looking at the sharp values uh, for two consecutive dates, we can try to understand which we can understand which one is the input variable that drives the change. So looking at uh, an example, here we see the, the trend of the prevalence of people with insufficient food consumption, which is one of the indicators that we estimate for one administrative area in Pakistan uh, in 2023, starting from January to September. So we can see this jump in July. And looking at the sharp values of the two different dates, we can see which uh, change drove, which input variable drove the change. And in this case, the input variables uh, that had the highest uh, difference in sharp values was the number of fatalities. So due to some conflict and fatalities, we had this uh, jump in the, in the estimate. For what concerns the forecasting, uh, this is, as I mentioned, something that is still under development and they were testing. So WSP has developed the first of its kind experimental methodology for machine learning. Uh, assisted forecast for uh, machine learning assisted forecasting food insecurity trends for 36 and 90 days in advance. This, of course, if, su if successful, uh, would be very useful for anticipatory action uh, and uh, would allow humanitarian operations to be deployed before a crisis develops, saving, of course, resources and acting timely. The model output can be interpreted, of course, also as categorical, so not just looking at the absolute value of the, of the estimate, but just looking at the different 
from the starting points. For example, if we look at this uh, at this plot, we see the prevalence with sufficient food consumption in one admin one in Nigeria, and we can see as of the 30th of January 2022. 2022, the comparison with the end of the year. So we can see in which category it falls. If there is a sharp increase, a slight increase, if it's stable, it's slightly decreasing, or sharply decreasing. This can uh, be helpful, especially with maybe not technical audience, uh, to improve interpretability and just to look at the direction of the change rather than the magnitude, which might not be that relevant. And now just to show you an example, here we you see the estimates, the forecast um, for uh, three admin one in Nigeria. We trained the model until uh, the end of January, 2023. And then we try to make the estimates for the next uh, 30, 30, 60 days. You see in blue, the target, so the data actually collected and uh, in red, the prediction with the confidence interval. So in this case, we see that the model was predicting a raise of insufficient food consumption in February, which is overall correct. And there was an average error of 4% on a 30-day prediction, which is pretty good. The, of course, the prevalence uh, just a percentage of people uh, with insufficient food consumption. So it's a number that goes between zero and one. Um, and in general, the limitation that we have for this model at the moment is that uh, we see that the model relies on a high amount of data, and these have to be also be of a quality data. So noise would, of course, uh, decrease the quality of our estimates. The model uh, cannot react to influences outside of input data. This looks quite obvious, but of course, if we didn't insert as input variable one variable that strongly influences the food security, this would not be, be seen by the model. So it's important to tailor uh, each model uh, according to what are the key drivers for each country. And also we see that the time horizon is pretty limited at the moment. So the forecast for the next 60 and 90 days is still too unreliable. We, of course, from these applications and uh, our tests learned multiple things. I would say that especially uh, for me, I think the, the most important is the, the fact that uh, the expertise from the field is very crucial, so it's difficult to work in a silo. So for us, the interaction with country offices, uh, food security experts uh, is very important in order to tweak the model and to see how better communicate the, the results. Also, for this reason, that because of this, uh, it's important uh, to better tweak the model to understand what are the drivers of food insecurity, because they can vary between specific region. For example, we saw a huge improvement in the model when inserting a calendar for Ramadan for the Muslim majority countries. Of course, the quality of the input data is crucial. So uh, a continuous data analysis and data quality on the data that we collect and that we or that we fetch uh, uh, for the model is uh, is definitely of utmost importance. And for what concerns the communication of the results and advocacy and sharing an extensive consultation and continuous consultation is, in the cont is always needed. For the next steps, of course, we, as I mentioned, all these um, methodologies in a continuous development, also the one that are already deployed. So for what's concerned the machine learning model, we are planning to include additional data sources that can capture better uh, local changes, uh, long-term changes, and incorporating more sophisticated version of the model to allow for longer and better predictions while feeding the model with, le with less data. We are open to research, joint research with the academic institute and other UN agencies. We have multiple collaborations already ongoing. And uh, for us, it's very important that our data is used. So uh, one of our priority, priority of the team is, of course, to make the data clear and available uh, to various stakeholders uh, in order for those to be, to be useful and to make the best use of the resources that, as mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, is pretty limited, unfortunately. And yeah, again, sorry for my 
tone of voice, but uh, I hope everything is clear and uh, um, thank you for the time. Yeah, thanks a lot, Julia, for this uh, very interesting and exciting presentation about activities that are ongoing in now casting and forecasting in this uh, domain. So uh, I feel that we that there will be a lot of questions. Uh, and as soon as if I get handed over some of them from the audience, uh, I will forward it to you. But uh, probably until this will happen, Julia, I, I have some questions already. <laughs> uh, so uh, what, what I, I saw in this categorical output, uh, that, that uh, you only report about the level, but do you also consider the uncertainty in what you are uh, reporting about the trend in this country? Yeah, so we, there, um, I, may, I might have went a bit quick on uh, that slide, but uh, we have a probability assigned to what, so for example, if you look at the forecast in 30 days, we have a probability for each category. So for example, if you have a, a sharp increase, light increase, uh, stable, so then you would have most likely one category where the probability is higher, but then you would have a certain amount of probability for also other categories. So you have also uncertainty estimation in that case. That of course is just a derivative from, you know, the estimate, the absolute value uh, estimate with the uncertainty interval. Sorry. So, so did you did you think about uh, also uh, including these new trends in machine learning that you uh, probably combine your output of the model with some natural language processing scheme such that probably based on what you predict that um, some text is generated that you can talk over to the stakeholders and to the organizations, politicians, for example, that probably can make more out of it than a kind of uh, category variable with some uncertainty uh, assigned to it? So um, I'm not sure like, if I fully understood what, what you're asking, but um, yeah, so of course we are looking at the way that it's better to, you know, like communicate our results, our data. Um, so this might be a possibility. We are not currently working on it, but kind of we are keeping an eye on uh, what are the possibilities on uh, to better, you know, share our results. At the moment for the forecasting, we have, as I mentioned, five pilots. So for example, Nigeria, Yemen, Haiti, and we have some dashboard where the results is shared uh, monthly with the country office with the, for the forecast. Okay. So I see at the moment no questions from uh, the the audience uh, that is participating here. I have, of course, ah, here. Not yet, nothing yet. Okay. Uh, well, if you don't mind, uh, Julia, I have uh, some more probably uh, more uh, high level question. So, uh, do you think about including feedback uh, that that you receive from the predictions and also? Uh, whether it was close enough to change something or whether you need to adapt your model because it was completely off. So do you think about including feedback uh, while you apply this uh, model? Yeah, so the idea, for example, for the forecasting, of course, is to have some sort of continuous retraining because the forecasting is uh, based on countries where we collect data. So we have, you know, we can compare by the way, the, like during the time we collect the data, then we compare how our forecast, how it, how it performs, so we would have uh, some sort of continuous retraining. And as I mentioned, is a kind of continuous work in progress to try to refine the input variables and how we we use it to try to, of course, reach the, um, the best model possible. But also I think that considering that this is not some sort of physical um, uh, quantity that we are trying to predict, also the key drivers might change in time. So for example, it might be that for certain months, certain variables are more relevant while maybe the situation changes and then uh, 
we might need to include some something additional and something becomes less relevant. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. So there's the first question by Andrew. Uh, he wants to know more inf um, information. He wants to, to know more information on the ML model that you are using for the predict, uh, predictions. So for the now classing model, this is a XGBoost model. We make a feature selection, uh, a recurrent feature selection, uh, removing the input variables one by one, trying to optimize the feature used. And also we conduct a grid search to optimize the appear parameters. This is a unique, like a global model. So we have only one model that is fit on uh, almost 80 countries in a large data set. And then we input the, the data, the input variables uh, for uh, oh. the various admin ones where, that we want to estimate. While for the um, work casting, we have two versions. The first one that we developed was kind of aligned with the now casting models is also a GBoost model, where we actually made one model for, for each time horizon that we want to predict. So we want to predict 30 days. So we have 30 versions, one that predicts tomorrow, the, another one that predicts the day after and so on. And then while for the model that we are actually now developing where most of the effort of the team is put and also for where we have the dashboard that, that I mentioned before is a reservoir computing uh, approach with some sort of a neural network, uh, a type of neural network. Where we use the where they, where we don't have a, the feature engineering component because what is fed into the model is the row time series. Wait, does this answer the question sufficiently, Andrew? Seems to be the case. <laughs> There's no objection. Uh, any other question? Yeah, so I, I still have some, but I hope that others have as well. Yeah, what, what I what I probably what is open. I didn't. Uh, I, I I forgot already the plots that you have shown for the forecasting in terms of the uncertainty level. I would expect that you the more you reach the ninety days, uh, that the, the more increases. the uncertainty is. Is this systematically visible in your experiments that it increases, or how do you yeah. manage that it's more or less constant? I, I, I thought that in one of the cases it was more or less constant. The uncertainty. I think it slightly increases, like uh, the uncertainty. So unfortunately, with this um, machine learning uh, algorithm, is not that straightforward to make an uncertainty estimate. So for the now casting model, we use a bootstrapping method. So we can just reshuffle the training set with some repetition and uh, refit the model and make the estimates. While for the reservoir computer, reservoir computer was a bit harder, so we had to work uh, with some different approach, which I would say that is also still under uh, kind of refinement. But uh, yeah, the idea is that, of course, with the estimates for the day after, like we make the a fit um, until today, we're using the data until today, and then we make the estimates for the coming 30 days. Tomorrow, the uncertainty. Uh, interval should be very narrow, and then by the by going back like farther in time, it should get larger. That's what we kind of also would like to to have and expect to have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's another very interesting and uh, I think really important question by Checo Willem Bruin. Does a model take into account its own influence on food security if it successfully predicts a shortage? Then that's then prevented. For example, that's counted as an error. I think it's important for all predictions if they are valid. Then of course they change what what is the outcome, and then if you also dynamically improve the quality of the model by such observation, that might get off in the future. Yeah, as I mentioned, like we have a continuous kind of retraining, so that we would expect that somehow, I mean, take into account we have, you know, like let's say imagine that we retrain it every week or even every day. Every day you would have one day of information more or one week of information more. So. This is some sort of process that we can automatize. Um, at the moment, we we, die, we do it monthly. So every month we add one month of data. Uh, so in this sense, kind of learns by his mistake in the sense that we provide every time we retrain it uh, one month of additional data. And that's why it's important that, uh, that the forecasting is based on 
countries where we continuously collect the data because in the moment that we would stop the data collection, for example, in Haiti, then we couldn't even check anymore if we are making mistakes or not because, yeah, we wouldn't have a baseline to compare it with. Okay. Yeah, then uh, Matt Blackstar is asking, do you collect indicators from health information systems? I'm um, not sure what are in the health information systems. So what we collect as WFP hunger monitoring unit are two food security indicators and uh, some indicators, for example, related to market access, uh, livelihood. Uh, uh, then other information, we take it from openly available data sources or other organizations. Well, the next question by Piga Mohammadpur. Do you use or have tested NASA's global precipitation mission rainfall data as input data? We did not, but uh, we are happy to receive the suggestions. If you, if someone like has good input, we are of course very open for any suggestion on input variables to be tested. What we try to to do is to use uh, openly available data, uh, and the other requirement, especially for the now casting model, is that they are available like for a large number of countries. So I guess that in this case, uh, I mean, this is the case. Uh, but for example, sometimes we we had um, information about fuel prices, but they were available just for very few countries. So we couldn't, uh, or we didn't have a data source that was you know, available for all the countries we wanted to cover. So it was making it hard for us to use it for the now casting, which is a global model. Yeah, just to mention that we have after this uh, session, the neural network where you can still continue to chat with, with Julia if some of the questions are not completely answered or I also, probably miscommunicated the questions. Okay, so are there any uh, other questions? So what what I, I, I still interested in is uh, you, you mentioned that you apply the, I think also the now casting with one, one model on all countries. So didn't you observe any domain shifts between the countries such that uh, there won't be a global model optimal? So that you adapt the models? So, yeah. so uh, it wouldn't be the optimal solution, the global model. The fact that, I mean, we go for this solution just because for certain countries where we want to make estimates, there is no historical data or very few, few data points. So for example, of course, for in certain countries, the remote data collection is uh, ongoing since 2018. So we have one data point for each admin one, every day since then. But there are countries where there was never a remote data collection, so a continuous data collection, but also was never done a face-to-face -face assessment or just very few face-to-face -face assessments were done. So for example, if for a country, we had two face-to-face -face assess historical face-to-face -face assessments since 2006, um, it would be hard to fit a model. So it's more uh, a need than uh, decision like this is a, the constraint that we have due to the data availability. Of course, if we had historic face to face assessments were performed since 2000, twice, three times a year in, a, in any country where we are interested in making the estimates uh, with the same methodology, um, then yeah, we could maybe do some, you know, some model clusterized per region or uh, even a country model, but this is not possible due to the data availability. This, of course, brings us to another problem in our uh, now casting methodology because we have a very unbalanced data set because for certain countries we have just very few data points and for certain we have thousands and thousands. So we need to do some sort of uh, balancing and uh, weighting, uh, trying to yeah, trying to balance it as much as possible. We can do a full balance, but uh, that's better than nothing. At least that's my that's my opinion. You do with what you have. Hey, thanks a lot. So I see that there's at the moment no further questions uh, in the pipeline. Uh, I'm also running out of questions. Uh, not, not all of them, but more the, the general ones. So what, what I have probably that's an off-topic question is, 
So uh, how do you uh, uh, include the, the most recent uh, advances and uh, progress in machine learning into your work? So uh, do you hire new people in, in your organization or do you have internships open such that people can learn what you are doing and probably also are excited and motivated to join you in the, in the future? So, um, yeah, we have multiple kind of possibilities in the sense that, uh, uh, of course, sometimes we have opening in the, in the team. Uh, we have uh, collaborations with external partners. partners. We have research projects with universities. So for example, at the moment, we have collaboration with the London School of Economics. Uh, we had it in the past with uh, other research institutes, for example, Easy Foundation in Turin. Um, we had interns, so there are multiple possibilities uh, uh, with WFP and uh, more specifically with, uh, with the team. Okay, so thanks a lot. I feel that we, we can close this uh, session here and go uh, to the neural network part. Uh, thanks again, Julia, for this Thank really you. interesting uh, presentation, also answering all these questions. Uh, I feel that it's good to see that machine learning is not just used to drive autonomous cars or to generate fancy images by text, but it can be used to help uh, important uh, social crises here worldwide. And uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed it uh, very much. And thanks again. Thank you very much. Thanks also to the audience for joining us. And so please continue chatting with uh, Julia in the neural network. Thank you. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions. Like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for Good program. Let's shape the future of AI for Good. AI is a powerful tool. summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values.
Thank you.